which of the two faces that you can see here is real? The left one or the one on the right? I can help you a bit by putting them into a bigger context. Now again, do you see which of the faces is real? Let me show you the full picture. What you see here are all fake faces. None of them is real. This is the result of a research project I did at ETH Zurich. It wasn't me using Photoshop or any other drawing tool and painting all those faces. No, it was rather me teaching a machine on how to imagine them. For me, this was a really big milestone in my life. Since I was a young boy, I was very addicted to computers. And I'm not just talking about playing video games, but also about creating my own software. And just the idea of teaching a machine to do certain things for me instead of programming it, it still strikes me. Those results were from 2017. Let's have a look about how researchers improved the quality even further within just a year. I could ask you now the same question. Which of the faces you see here are real? Sadly, none of them. You could have a look all around the world, walk, all, walk down all the streets, and you wouldn't find those people, simply because they don't exist. And the technology behind this is called generative models, and it's a subfield of machine learning. And to give you another impression of what, how new this area is, I want to show you the following graph. So what you see here is the amount of research publications about generative models for the last few years. The first thing you will notice is it just started in 2014, so it's a quite new field. And when I did my research in 2017, you could even say that I was amongst the first few hundred people in this area. And now it's exploding with more than 500 publications by the date. For me, it was imagination of faces and for others, they use the same technology to create videos or voices, as you see here in this example. As a recent member of America's Unemployed, I found myself with a difficult choice. Should I live off my state pension on a beach, or should I return to the workforce? I can tell you I don't have a lot of money, but what I do have are a very particular set of skills, which is why I'm launching Honest Berry's Fake IDs, authentic-looking documents. Guaranteed to fool even the most stable genius. Our driver's licenses, social security cards, and passports are the best money can buy. Honest Berry's fake IDs. We also do birth certificates. <laughs> as you could imagine, this video was fake as well. What you saw here was the creative work of a masterpiece using one of those smart machines. And this is why I'm here today. I want to talk about whether we need any additional laws in a digital world. The internet is still very young. It's in its early days, people say. And new technologies emerge with it every year. I want to talk today about the question, how we ended up being here, why we should give it an additional thought, and what we can do about it. So let me start by diving into the how we ended up being here. As you might have heard already, we live in a world full of data. We have mountains full of images, seas full of videos, and cities full of text. And over the last years, we learned on how to create algorithms to use this data and to make predictions. Those algorithms, we call them models. And the predictions, we use them in our everyday life. We have them all the time with us on our smartphones. They help us to search for relevant information. They help us to navigate from A to B. And they also help us translating languages we don't understand. But I also want to tell you a bit why we should give this technology an additional thought. My fellow Americans, those pesky Democrats, are refusing to fund my big, beautiful wall. So I am declaring a national state of emergency. The good news is that I've already decided where to put this new state. The bad news is that we are going to need a bigger wall. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless all 51 of these United States. I'm sorry to disappoint some of you, but also this video was fake. What you saw here was a machine being taught on how to speak with the voice of Donald Trump. And this is a bit why it's dangerous here, because some people might actually think this was really Donald Trump speaking. What if a video suddenly appears of Trump declaring war to North Korea? How do you know whether it was real or not? 
I don't only want to focus on the potential negative impact this technology can have. I also want to highlight some more of the positive ones. Have you ever thought about being part of a Hollywood blockbuster, for example? Standing next to a superstar like Leonardo DiCaprio? Or simply, how about becoming Leonardo DiCaprio yourself? I thought about that, and I did it. So it just took me three, min three minutes of video material of me and Leonardo, and one day of computational power, and this new technology. Let's have a look at the results. Tell us of the accommodations in steerage, Mr. Dolson. I hear they're quite good on this ship. The best I've seen, ma'am. Hardly any rats. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dawson is joining us from the third. Amazing, isn't it? Now I talked a bit about how we ended up here and why we should give this technology an additional thought. So let's come to the third point, what we should do about it. And if you look back in history, it's not the first time we have a new revolutionizing te technology at the front of our doorstep. Let's have a look at, for example, how cars changed our lives. Cars we use now every day to move faster from A to B. Let's look at the history of cars. In 1820, we had the first steam-powered car. And in 1885, we had the famous Motorwagen patent from Carl Benz, the guy who started Mercedes, a company you all should know. In 1905, we had the first law in Switzerland about maximum speed. And here's the catch. There was no way how to enforce it because we didn't have any radar system. <laughs> but the shocking thing here is that in 1933, more than a century after the first cars hit, hit the road, we had the first law about traffic regulation in Switzerland. And now, do we want to wait another century until we introduce any laws about those smart machines or robots which are just being developed? Some people already gave this question a thought, such as Isaac Asimov's Free Laws of Robotics, which he introduced already in 1942. And also I had time to reflect on this topic during my research. What I was building was very powerful, and with great power comes great responsibility. Should we just leave everyone doing what they want with this new technology? Or should we just stop all the research in this area, eventually even giving up the cure for cancer? No, for me, it doesn't really sound reasonable, since I'm a researcher myself. But I think that we all should ask for more transparency. Transparency in what people are researching, and transparency in what our data is being used for. Because our data is the driving fuel for this technological revolution, the data we upload to the internet every day by using our smartphones. And it doesn't just end with having more transparency. We also need more education. Education about how this technology works, and education about what you can do with this kind of technology. And here's my ask for you. Please go out and talk to your friends. Tell them what you learned today and educate them. And eventually, hopefully, we will have ethics for those machines being developed. Please be aware that we are at the very birth of this technological revolution. And without the right ethics, structure, and motivation, who's keeping me from doing something stupid? Who's keeping me from doing something stupid? <laughs> Who's keeping me from doing something stupid? Thank you very much.